Shelly Miscavige. She has not appeared in public since 2005. Where's Shelly and what happened? Where is Shelly? We're looking at like 17 years of a person just missing. Shelly Miscavige was given into the sole care of L. Ron Hubbard by her parents when she was 12. This is where Shelly is believed to be being held captive. Do you believe that Shelly Miscavige is a threat today? Oh, absolutely. She's seen it all. She's been by his side the whole time. Hey guys, welcome to the channel. Welcome to another episode of Where is Shelly Miscavige? I'm your host for today, Mark Headley. And joining me is going to be my lovely wife, Claire Headley. Hello. Thanks for doing this with me, honey. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is a continuation of the Where is Shelly Miscavige series. And in past videos, we talked about uh, Claire and I talked to each other about Claire's history at the international headquarters and working with Shelly Miscavige. And the point that we got up to in our last video was when you were uh, assigned to be an RTC representative in Florida and you were overseeing the training and the implementation of other religious technology uh, Sea Org members, religious technology Sea Org members in different continents and places to be RTC reps. And right before you were supposed to be posted as the RTC rep for Celebrity Center, you were brought back to the international headquarters. Yes, exactly. So that's where we're going to pick up today. Yes. And we'll link to part one of this, this conversation for anyone who missed that. Um, and just as the overview, obviously, Shelly Miscavige was... Um, second in command during the entire time we worked at the headquarters she was with dave 24 7 david miscavige um not only as a, as his wife but more so and primarily as his assistant and so it was obviously very huge uh to hear that she had been take removed altogether and vanished for all intents and purposes um in 2006 uh, so now she, uh, and in terms of contact with even her family, I think the last contact she had with a, even any of her family was 2014. So now, uh, that's a, an awful long time for a human being to be isolated. And that was the inspiration for doing this series in the first place is to continue the important question, where is Shelly? Because it emphasizes and epitomizes what's wrong or one of the many things that are wrong with Scientology in terms of their capacity to do this to a human being. Yeah. So when you ended up going back to the base, what year was that? <clears throat> that was January 2000 and no, sorry, January 1997. That's right. Okay, good. So that's yeah. right after the Golden Age of Tech was released. Um, and all of these uh, courses, new courses that Scientologists were being demanded to do and required to do, um, was just implemented the year before in 1996. And then, um, and then that's when also when all these RTC reps were established, because there didn't used to be RTC reps in every single continent. There no. Was yeah, that's right. Okay. And and the purpose of those representatives at each organization, one of their primary purposes was to give da uh, David Miscavige, quote, eyes and ears on the ground, somebody that was loyal to him and was the, uh, the police part of the Inspector General Network of Scientology, able to go in at all different levels and do whatever uh, David Miscavige wanted done. So that was one of the primary purposes of establishing those positions. And they were established in Europe, in Australia, um, in Los Angeles, um, where else? In UK. UK. Yep. And uh, I think those were the, um, oh, and also, and yeah, Florida. Florida, of course. Yeah, Florida, they had already been an office there. So this was now expanding this program so that there were, Religious Technology Center staff all over the world. 
Okay, so when you got back to the base, um, so you're not going to be a religious technology center representative at Celebrity Center. Um, you go back to the imp base. Okay, then tell us what happens then. Yes. So um, at the time, there was a unit within Religious Technology Center called AVC, Authorization, Verification, and Correction. And their primary responsibility and role was to oversee the management of Scientology. So for example, any communication going out from management executives at, at that headquarters had to be authorized by RTC, by ABC. And so I was, uh, Shelly assigned, Shelly Miscavige assigned me to be the director of correction in ABC. So the C of correction. And what that meant is that I was responsible for working with the management executives from the, you know, the top down. So Mark Yeager, Mark Ingberg, Guillaume Lasserve, all the, the, anyone that was at that time, well known in the world of Scientology as an executive, I was then responsible for making sure they were doing what David Miscavige told them to do. And if they weren't doing it, then they had to be corrected. And that usually involved them studying or restudying some L. Ron Hubbard policies or getting interrogated to find out what their crimes were or what they were doing instead of their job. Right. Because in Scientology, the premise is that if you're not doing what you're told, if you're non-complying, if you're changing what you're told to do, then nine times out of 10, the reason for that is because you've you have transgressions that you need to confess to. And then once you've relieved yourself of those transgressions, then you can study the Hubbard policies that you're supposed to be doing, study the David Miscavige orders. Uh, so oftentimes, um, actually even at that point, it had already started changing to where the primary emphasis was on what David Miscavige ordered, not necessarily what Hubbard had ordered. Um, and so, yes, that was, and, and so a primary part of my role as well from that point forward in January, 1997 was then attending all the many meetings that David Miscavige had with management executives to take notes and to make sure that, uh, you know, just to know what he was telling them to do to then play a role in making sure that they did those things. And Shelley was at almost all of those meetings as well. Yes. I mean, during that time period, uh, Shelley was always with Dave. If it was at a meeting or he was just walking through a production area or doing an inspection, anything, um, Shelley was there for that. And was Shelley the one that was giving you directives or telling you who that needed to be handled or how did that work exactly? Yes. Good question. So at that time, <clears throat> things were already starting to go south. Um, I mean, not that they hadn't been previously, but the progression was getting worse and worse in terms of uh, David Miscavige uh, would very often um, involve physical violence in those meetings um, with the involved executives. Uh, he would often lose his temper. He would often have people hauled out for handlings. Um, Shelly was always at that time trying to figure out what to do to fix things, to, to get the executives performing to David Miscavige's liking. Um, but I think already at that point, so we're talking now, nine, 1997, 1998, um, Shelly had expressed several times, uh, to me and to, some other RTC staff that she was really concerned about David Miscavige and that she thought he'd had a psychotic break. She didn't provide a whole lot of details as to what was making her say that, but she was working really hard to get David Miscavige into Scientology's counseling. And at the time, I was working very closely with another RTC staff member named Angie Trent. She was um, at the highest, she was one of, I think she was actually the highest trained person on that property. She was a 
class 12 auditor, which is the highest that you can go. And she was also OT8, which was the highest, is still the highest you can go. Um, and in she, terms of the counseling. Yes, in terms of the grade chart, Scientology's levels. So she was at the very top. Um, and that's, that's how she, why, that was why she'd been brought into religious technology center and why Shelly felt that she would be a good person to counsel him and take him into session as it's called in Scientology. Well, and, and at that, but well, I just want to rewind real quick. Was that before or after John Eastman and some of the, and, uh, what was that, uh, Miriam, there was a bunch of people that were kind of on that list to become his auditor. And over the years, I mean, I think it started with Ray Midoff, and then who was the senior CS International, then John Eastman, who was the senior CS International, and then was then Angie after those guys? Yes, she was well after those people. Okay. Um, because she, she was, she had all of his uh, folders. So when you, when you receive counseling in Scientology, every single, um, counseling session is recorded. Every word you write, you say is written down. The questions you're asked is written down. The response from the e-meter is written down. The end result is written down everything. Um, and so Angie had his David Miscavige's folders and he had not been, um, received any counseling since 1993. And that was 1993 is when um, John Eastman, I think was the last person who had audited David Miscavige. And so Shelly was pushing very, very hard to have Angie get ready and plan everything. And Angie was working on preparing for this for at least two months. And then it was a matter of David Miscavige needed to get enough sleep to go into session. Um, anyway, long story short, that never happened. But my point of even bringing this up is the fact that Shelly said he'd had a psychotic break and she was worried he, he was going to, things were going to get much worse, which of course they did. Um, but she, even back then in 1998, Shelly was seeing things go south pretty quickly. Um, this was also during the time and the significant events in Scientology's history when the lawsuits were ongoing in relation to the, the tragic death of Lisa McPherson, who died at the Fort Harrison Hotel, and who David Miscavige had been directly involved in, in overseeing the auditing and counseling that was done with Lisa McPherson prior to her death. Um, so that was bringing, yeah. Well, I was just going to say in the end, even though David Miscavige was directly telling the counselors at the Florida, at the flag land base in, in Clearwater, Florida, even though he was telling them exactly what to do, he was doing it via the RTC rep office that was in Florida. And the person that was the RTC rep in Florida was Angie Trent. Yes. And so that when later on, now he's supposed to get audited by Angie Trent and this lawsuit is blowing up, he then, she got in trouble because she was involved with the Lisa McPherson, um, that whole horrible situation. And so wasn't she as made a dishwasher in Golden Era Productions, the highest trained Scientologist in the world that's also supposed to audit David Miscavige. She did end up being assigned a dishwasher. And so she never did end up doing any counseling with David Miscavige. Right. Yes, exactly. David Miscavige claimed that it was way too much of a distraction and a reminder of those ongoing lawsuits to have Angie do any counseling with him. And so shortly thereafter, she ended up as a dishwasher in the galley at, so in the, the food service facility that provided all the meals to everyone that lived at that property. Um, yeah, she was. Well, wasn't there other things that Shelly did? I remember like whenever we were staying up all night and all day doing getting things ready for a Scientology event or getting something ready for David Miscavige. <clears throat> there was a problem that the staff, because they'd been up for so many nights and days and nights, um, they were falling asleep and didn't 
Shelly had some kind of concoction that she would have made to give to us, and we would have to drink this concoction. There were a few evolutions of those types of things. Yes, I think at one point it was uh, wheatgrass juice. Um, so there, there were all these like plats of plants that then would get, you know, mincified, like purified, uh, pulverized. Pulverized is the right word. It wasn't juiced. even juice. Well, no, it wasn't juice. It was more oh, than right. that. It was more than that. Like it was literally pulverized. And yes, it was like, but it was like this thick, grassy juice. Um, and then other times there was, um, she was having, uh, like super tonic, that garlic, super yeah. strong Didn't, concoction. Another time rocket fuel, the rocket fuel was a different thing. Yes. Rocket okay. fuel was a separate thing to super tonic. And then another time she was making all the, the top executives do enemas. Uh, oh, I'm glad I missed that on that one. <laughs> I touched a bullet on that one. That's that's a real thing because they were toxic. They were they were. I mean, that was the thing. It was always there was. I think there was another team. Uh, there was another time period when a lot of us were being accused of like being zombies or something or being. What was that? Wasn't there okay. some weird thing? Yeah. So this was in '98, going into '99, I think. Shelly had me do this whole project. So it lasted about six months where I was sending her a report every single day. And the, the short version of the story is that Shelly was trying to understand why these top executives who were go-getters, gung-ho, enthusiastic, like at Flag or in other places, and then they would come to this property and everything would fall apart. And all of a sudden they were just non-performing and they were downtrodden. And, you know, of course, in retrospect, you go, well, yeah, the closer you get to David Miscavige, the worse things get. Everybody knows that. <laughs> but, um, but Shelly was trying to handle this. And so this project that she had me do was she had me research thousands and thousands of, um, documents written by L. Ron Hubbard that people, you know, people didn't have access to, to research if computer screens were causing hypnotism of the people using them, because the management executives would sit in front of their, these cathode ray tube computer screens for hours, you know, like all day. Yeah. 18 <laughs> hours a day, easily, sometimes 24 hours a day, you know, um, so, so it was literally like a scientific quote, uh, I shouldn't say scientific, a scientological test where, um, I had to, so she, she picked, I think it was 20 of the key executives. Maybe it was 15. I don't remember. Um, but I remember one of them being Diane Canaeus cause she had, she had been a, a flat, uh, an executive in Clearwater who was very instrumental in getting the whole golden age of tech training launch completed. Like she, she was a key person in that. And so she had been brought to the base to be over all, um, training international. And she was not doing well at all. She was constantly in trouble with David Miscavige. So she was somebody who was on that list, Mark Ingber, Guillaume LeServe, um, Mark Yeager, I think, maybe not Mark Yeager, because he was on the Rehabilitation Project Force, which that's another story we'll talk about. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but so a lot of the key executives. So I had to do a whole battery of Scientology tests with them. So the Oxford Capacity Analysis Test, the IQ test, the Aptitude Test. Um, and of course, as you and I both know, um, anyone who's reached that point has done these tests hundreds of times, hundreds of times. So yes, the aptitude test is a timed test. Oh, the leadership test is another one. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the point being that it, when you've done the, these tests so many times, you're not really getting a, a, a fair shake, if you will. But either way, the, the, the project that Shelly had me doing was do a whole battery of tests, like have all these executives do these tests. And then, um, 
swap out their computer screens to LED screens. And yes. then and then periodically because in Scientology, even though they have tons and tons of money, they're not spending it on the staff or the employees. So even in the late 1990s, even though LED screens have been out for years and years, almost everyone there still had the big giant CRT screens. And some of us, most of us had monochrome, these monochrome tube uh, CRT TVs called QM workstations. And they were like a green screen, like the text was green against a, like a kind of a, a milky background. And these things, they were white when we bought them, but they were yellow from cigarette smoke from the Sea Org members for 20 or 30 years. Right. And um, we had to put lead, we were starting to have to put lead screens in front of all those CRT screens during this time who, for anybody who didn't, couldn't get a, a new LED screen. Yes. And I think, and so part of Shelley's theory was that hypnotism was a piece of it. And then also radiation was a piece of it. And so this is, this is the, the project that then ultimately later led to Shelley deciding that most everybody in an executive position would have to redo the purification rundown. And because they it, it hadn't been done properly according to Shelley. Um and and Amy Scobie talks about this too cuz she was on the purification rundown for I think months and months and months and at super high levels of niacin which is at those doses to my understanding and I'm no scientist but it's a uh, carcinogenic levels to take that much niacin. Um and of course, you're, when you do the purification rundown, you're supposed to keep doing it until you get no more reaction. So if you keep having a reaction, you have to keep doing the program. And we're um, talking about 15,000 milligrams of niacin, like tons and tons. I don't remember the exact it was, amount. No, it, it went up to 5,000 milligrams. There you go. 5,000 5, milligrams, milligrams a day, including, yeah. and that that was just one vitamin. You had to take um, <clears throat> equal like proportions of a lot of other vitamins with that. So by the time you reach the end of the purification rundown, you'd be like, have a whole hand, like a massive handful of vitamins. And then you're also supposed to drink, be drinking CalMag, the calcium magnesium drink and, um, lecithin and, and oil. Um, yeah. So you're, because you're supposed to be replacing the toxins in your body with all these other things, not, not medically endorsed, not medically proven. I don't think it's even been medically studied. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, anyway, the point being that Shelly was, she was very much at that stage trying to still tr holding out hope that somehow she could use Hubbard's uh, ideas to make things better. You know, she was, I, I always thought that she was a very dedicated, firm believer. She would tell me stories all the time about working with L. Ron Hubbard when she was a young girl on, on the, the ship. And, um, anyway, so, but yeah, so that, that was an example of one of the projects she had me do. And it ended up being, um, something that David Miscavige briefed the whole property on, like he would do these briefings to everybody in, in the dining hall, it would get converted into a massive, uh, you know, seats for everybody, everybody had to attend mandatory attendance, except for like a skeleton security crew. Um, but yeah, so <clears throat> that, that, that was an example of a project that I did for Shelly. Um, and again, I was writing daily reports to her saying, here's, here's what got done. Um, I would send her packs and packs and packs of all the Hubbard advices and Hubbard writings that I had poured through trying to find what he'd said about anything remotely relevant to hypnotism and, uh, non-performance of management and anyway, on and on. So there is a Hubbard writing somewhere that says TV will hypnotize you, right? The TV that's right. That's right. And that's why uh, that came out in the the mid to or maybe early 80s, I think like 82, 83, because that's when I, I mean, I was in the 
cadet organization at in England, and that's when all the TVs were first taken away because we weren't yeah. we weren't told why. As a kid, I had no idea. I was like, man. Our life already sucks, and now they've taken TV away. <laughs> but yeah. So, so then, what are some of the other things? Because at a certain point, you're the director of Correction Religious Technology Center, and you're working with Shelley on these different projects. At a, was there anything else that happened when you were a director of Correction that happened before you got promoted to the to the next post in RTZ? Yes. So, <clears throat> starting in end of 98 and early 99 uh, was when Marty Rathbun resumed the, his position as the inspector general. And he was now, so he was now the head of RT, head of religious technology center. He was David Miscavige's right-hand man. And he put incredible emphasis on uh, interrogations and security checking and rollbacks, which is where, uh, like any any person non-performing or doing something other than what they're supposed to be doing, or even voicing a critical thought, they would get put on the e meter and asked, "Who gave you that idea? Like, uh, you know, you did X. Who were you talking to just before that?" And it was like became this um, uh, witch hunt type mentality much more so than it had even been previously and <clears throat> marty would always send up reports of these interrogations to david miscavige um so if if david miscavige ordered somebody to get interrogated marty would take them interrogate them and then send a report to david miscavige to say what that person had confessed to and <clears throat> so marty started um doing all these, uh, seminars, I think, or, uh, seminar is not the right word, but like these <clears throat> classes to train all the ethics officers on the property, all the MAA master at arms, the anyone responsible for doing this to make sure that they were doing it thoroughly and doing it properly. And he had, he was directly supervising that. And my point of that is that, <clears throat> It's, it just, it literally started de deteriorating into a witch hunt. Also around that time, David Miscavige was doing, uh, issued a number of evaluations for various different things. And this is when David Miscavige decided that all the organizing boards, the structure charts of every single organization had to be completely redone. Um, <clears throat> and so this just led to, um, a period of time where we were getting very, very little sleep, maybe two, three hours a night doing all these investigations. This was also when the follow the money strategy came in from David Miscavige. If somebody is misperforming, then they had to be getting kickbacks of some kind in his view. He also started just dictating what, what somebody's crimes were and Marty would take them off and wouldn't come back until the person had confessed to that, which, I already then I was starting to go like, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, you know, how can you I possibly know <laughs> what the person has done? <laughs> I remember that there was one guy that that had happened to, and he was the person that replaced me in manufacturing. What then? And I then went on to go do another post in the cine division or something like that. But the guy that replaced me, his name was Al, and he had been in the Navy. And he worked on a nuclear submarine. That was what his post was uh, when he was in uh, in the Navy. And so David Miscavige had basically said, that guy's a plant um, because there's no way you could get those kind of clearances or whatever. And then he should never have been able to get to the international headquarters, blah, 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 blah. And I remember he got taken off interrogated for months and months and months and months and months. And then in the end, he just went back to post. It was like, yeah, no, he was, he was in the Navy. He was like, he was on a submarine. That was, that, that that's what happened. <laughs> he right. wasn't a plug. <laughs> yeah. There was the same theory about Wendell Reynolds who had been over all Scientology management finances for decades. Um, and I can't remember what it was, but there was something from Wendell's past, like when he was a teenager or something that was 
slightly nefarious or is part of some motorcycle gang or so I can, I honestly can't remember, but yeah, there, it was all these conspiracy theories of, you know, that, that David Miscavige and Shelley both were like, oh, this person, you know, this person has been sent in, find out what, who they're reporting to, who they're taking orders from, you know, uh, they started doing, um, they had Marty start doing uh, PDH checks. So it's for pain drug hypnosis, which is how Hubbard deemed that somebody would be turned into a plant is through use of pain drug and hypnosis. It was literally like spy versus spy on spy on spy. I don't know, just craziness. But, but so, <clears throat> so these evaluations came out from David Miscavige where he dictated everything that was wrong with Scientology and how to fix it. And right around that time, so now we're talking July 99, and that was significant for me because that's when I had my massive motorcycle accident where I completely broke my leg um, above my ankle, both bones clean through, the impact broke my shoulder. This happened on the property. Because David Miscavige was there, they didn't call 911. They didn't call an ambulance. They, uh, Kevin Catano put a splint on my leg and then they put me into the little red Honda that the medical officer would drive. And she drove me to Hemet hospital, uh, as a result of which I almost lost my leg. They, when, when I, when I arrived into the ER, I was so in shock. And I remember that the ER personnel were so angry. They were like, who did this to you? And I was just like, I don't know, because I didn't, you know, I was in shock and I knew I couldn't say Kevin Catano did this to me. <laughs> that would have been a uh, big, big boo boo, not allowed, um, not safe to do. So I just said, I don't know, but they were super livid about that. And, and yes, I think five hours of testing, like, cause I arrived around two in the afternoon <clears throat> and they were still testing by like into the evening to see if I was going to lose my foot completely, which in retrospect was terrifying. At the time I'd had so little sleep and I was in shock. So I just didn't understand what was happening, but, um, I got, so then, yeah. Yeah. So I had, you know, I had several conversations with Shelly about that and she, she just, you know, of course, now I was labeled a potential trouble source because I'd had a major accident. And she, I remember specifically one night she called me up to her office. Um, and she, she just said, oh, and by this time I was able to walk again. So this was several months later, but I had a cane. So originally when the accident happened, I was in a wheelchair. Then I was in a walker. I had a walker and then I had a cane. So by the time, so this I think was three or four months after I'd had the accident and I went up to her office to see her with my cane and she was like, look at you, this is structural damage. And I was like, yes, yeah, sir. Um, and <clears throat> she was essentially just kind of trying to, make she was she was concerned and she wanted to make sure i was okay but she was also kind of shocked like i think by the fact that i had a cane and i you know i don't know it's it was um a very tumultuous period for her as well because at that by this time now david and shelly were spending a lot of time in clearwater directly dealing with the the lawsuits surrounding lisa mcpherson I think there was a criminal and a civil trial, uh, or civil a criminal case and a civil case. And, um, and for some reason that I don't particularly recall the details of, but this, the criminal case specifically was very much like David Miscavige thought it was going to completely shut down Scientology. <clears throat> what his theory and understanding of that was, I, I'm not necessarily, I don't, I don't know why he thought that. I mean, obviously it was a terrible thing that happened. Um, yeah, it would have set a precedent if 
they could say that some, somebody that died in Scientology, that that was Scientology was responsible for that, right. and not the person signing their life away when they sign all these documents. Um, that that's sort of, I think that's really how Scientology gets away with a lot of this is that when you first get into Scientology, you sign a whole bunch of documents to say, if anything bad happens, it's not Scientology's fault. And right. you know that going in. So if they went to court for wrongful death or for something that Scientology did, then that could have repercussions internationally for all, because there was all sorts of people that would love to sue Scientology. And if they knew they could do it this way, then they'd win. So yep. that and was it's essentially, that was the reason why this was a big deal. And that's also the reason why Scientology very rarely lets any of these cases go to trial. They almost invariably settle them if they can before it goes to trial. Um, so Okay, so anything else while you were the director of cor uh, corrections? Um, no, though, <clears throat> still all through those years, Shelley was very involved in overseeing the celebrities in Scientology, particularly the high profile ones like Tom Cruise. It was during those years that, um, for example, I did a lot of research for Shelley in relation to Jim Carrey and trying to get him into Scientology. Anyway, we've we've talked about that in other places, and it's not particularly relevant to Shelley's state of mind and 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 this and what we're talking about here. So yeah, the next so the next significant change was that in March of 2000, I was moved from director of correction to the position called internal executive. Um, which oversaw all the internal workings of religious technology center. So I was over uh, staff recruitment, staff training, staff morale, um, finances, um, and yeah. Correction. Yes, exactly. But the correction of, of religious technology center. So when you were the direct der, der correction RTC, you were part of AVC and that post is supposed to get executives and other organizations as well as religious technology corrected. But then when you go to um, the director or der internal or internal exec, then you're responsible for just religious technology center people getting corrected. You don't have to get other people corrected necessarily. That's right. Yep. Was that also the time period? Because that when was that when you got when you moved to that post? March 2000. So I was that position from March 2000, pretty much solidly until September 2004, which is when I after that when I ended up in the hole because I okay. because I wouldn't divorce you. Yeah. Good job, babe. Um, was there a time period because I've covered this in the spy files a little bit? Um, on this channel, we have a, a, a series called the Scientology Spy Files and the Tom, Scientology's Tom Cruise Spy Files. But there's two individuals that keep coming up in those files, which is Michael and Andrea Dovin. Wasn't there a time when they were getting, they were being dealt with by Religious Technology Center because they were working in Tom Cruise's camp, feeding information to Religious Technology Center, but weren't they getting corrected and pulled in and interrogated by people in Los Angeles? And did they ever come to the international headquarters to do that as well? Yes. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about that in part one, um, because okay. because those that when Michael and Andrea were at the at the headquarters was in 95 ish. Um, yeah. So it was before I was in Religious Technology Center, but I was doing things with them at during the time that they were getting um, handled by Religious Technology okay. Center. By handled, of course, we mean interrogations and yeah, studying but, Hubbard and yeah. Yeah. So then, okay. So then let's fast forward back to 2000. Okay. So now you're the dirt, you're the internal exec RTC. Yep. And that is literally, that is it, the post. You're in charge of internal for RTC. That is what it is. Yes. Yeah. So that so that David Miscavige doesn't have to worry about the internal workings of Reli Religious Technology Center. That's done by the inspector general who would have been your boss, right? That's that, right. So then your boss would have been Marty. Yep. And, and, then and Marty's boss was David Miscavige. There you go. Okay. <clears throat> yep. 
Okay, so then what what so what type of things did you do as internal exec for Shelly? Or what was Shelly asking about or what were your interactions with Shelly during that time period? Yes. So during those years, Shelly actually was acting as my boss more so than Marty was. Um so I would have meetings with anytime she was at that property, I would go up to her office every day and review my to-do list, my battle plan as it was called. Uh, <laughs> with Shelly. And most often it had included, uh, for example, handlings with various different staff, the, the frequent flyers, should we say, like the people that were commonly dis that I would commonly discuss with Shelly, uh, who were struggling to conform to David Miscavige's requirements was Norman Starkey, Warren McShane, and of course, Warren is in Religious Technology Center to this day as the, the over legal and office of special affairs, um, Marty Rathbun. Um, and so for even though he was your boss, yes. <laughs> yeah, that was that's where it got kind of a little strange because um, because Shelly's telling you, Marty needs to do this, this, and this. And then you would have to go to Marty and say, Marty, you have to do this, this, and this, even though technically he's your boss on the org board, but Shelly's your boss in real life. Like who's telling you what you need to do as well as Marty. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it kind of created this strange push pull situation of, uh, you know, Marty was supposed to ha Marty did have seniority over me, but if Shelly is coming in from the side and saying, Hey, he's non-performing, go, go find out what his crimes are or go interrogate him or this, that, the other thing, then I had to do it, you know? Yeah. And, and oftentimes it was, um, it, during these years, it, it continued to deteriorate. So there was a time when there was a whole, so there's, the e meter, the phenomena on the e meter, the um, called a rock slam, where the needle is erratically bouncing back and forth. We've talked about this before. And somebody who has that is somebody who has evil intentions towards Scientology and David Miscavige and Hubbard if, the, if it happens while they're talking about that. Well, so during this time, Shelley somehow developed this theory that Norman Starkey absolutely must be a rock slammer. And I was tasked with finding it or otherwise I was going to go to the rehabilitation project force if I didn't, you know, so it was situations like this that just were, you know, you're kind of trapped by the circumstance in which you find yourself. And, and really, as we've talked about, that property was more secure than Supermax by my understanding, not that I've ever been to Supermax, but I think I think that prisoners have more freedom than Sea Org members at that property. You get paid more too, I think, in some prisons. Um, okay, so then, so that's, so that during this period, this is also when, I mean, you're talking about a lot of things that happened in that 2000 to 2004, because yeah. that is really when um, people were escaping at a very uh, alarming rate as well. Like I would say, every few weeks or every month, somebody was GTFO and out of that. <laughs> there was, there was a time when it was at least weekly. Um, okay. and sometimes even every day. And so for example, um, even some people from religious technology center, like there was a woman that tried to escape and she left in the dead of night from her house, which was just on the border of that property. Like she wasn't that far away. Um, yeah. And she fell in a ditch and couldn't get out. And that's how they caught her and brought her back. Um, and then other ones where like the, the main person who was responsible for ethics in RTC, who had to make sure that all the staff were behaving and doing what they're supposed to be doing. She went to, I think her brother's wedding or something, and then she just refused to come back. <laughs> I got in trouble for that. I, oh, and, and also during that time, let's not forget, that's when Marty escaped. So I, yeah. I was his junior and he <laughs> came through my office and he was like, okay, I'm go going down to go, to go to attend a meeting with David Miscavige. He got on his bike and he left and he never showed up. 
And he I remember, I remember that meeting. I was at that meeting yep. and we all showed up for the meeting. We were all sitting in there and we couldn't start the meeting until everyone had arrived. And then once every single person arrived, then somebody would call um, Shelly or Larice or whoever and say, okay, we're all here. And then David Miscavige at his leisure would get together and come down to the meeting. And we were at the meeting and we were all waiting. And I remember Lisa Schroer, who was the commanding officer at the time, was like, we're all here except for Marty. And then it was like, where's Marty? And then after like 10 minutes, it was like, oh, he be gone. Yeah. He's out. He's done. Because you would never not show up to a meeting if David Miscavige said, we're having a meeting. You have right. to be at that meeting. And you have to get there within a minute or else the entire world will end. Right. And, and so, so but he hadn't been in 10 minutes. It was like, oh, he's he's long gone. Yeah, I think. <laughs> and and so Larice started radioing me first, then Shelly, and they were up. They were both like, where's Marty? And I'm like, he went down to the meeting. And then I think even you radioed me, I, as I recall, to say, where's Marty? <laughs> right. I remember because we had the next tell bleep, bleep, bleep fun. So we would yeah. chirp and be like, hey, you know, we're all here except for Marty. This is a big problem. And then that's why I think when you had said, oh, yeah, I don't, he, he said he left. And then it was like, oh, yeah. He gone and he just drove he well because he was the second in command of the base so if he had a motorcycle and he was going to go from one side of the property to the other you could just go through the gates that would open out to the highway and that is how a lot of people crossed because it was quicker than going through all the tunnels to get to the other side right you would just drive from one place to the other and he said hey i'm going across the road and they opened the gate and he just drove off down the highway he never and he never came back yeah and remember too that already by this time Technically, you didn't have to cross over the road because there was the tunnel leading under That's the I'm property. Saying, it was quicker to go just across the highway, though, oh, yeah. as opposed to going through the tunnels. There were yeah. two tunnels, but it was easier. And also, the, the way to get into the tunnel, if it was raining or anything, there were accidents all the time in there because it was very slippery. So people yeah. would wipe out going through the tunnel all the time. So it was just like, just... Because everyone's driving too fast. Everyone hasn't slept. Everyone's, there's other people coming. So yeah. it's easier just to go across the highway. But you weren't supposed to do that because then people would GTFO down the highway <laughs> instead right. of going across. Yeah. And, okay, I, so and then, security <laughs> had not even realized that he did that. Like, I, I'm sure now they're way more, uh, they probably just don't let staff cross over the highway at all. But yeah, um, but there's we could probably make a list pretty long of the number of people that GTFO using this method. <laughs> yes. um, but yeah, so he took off and um, and oh boy, the the blow drill that went into place to track him down was outrageous. I do not even honestly know how many people were involved but it was a lot because it was hundreds i remember yeah. it was the, and just so we could clarify it a blow drill is a, a blow in scientology is when you have an unauthorized departure so you can blow from a course you can blow from staff you can you can just leave the course and not go back and do the course they call that a blow so from the int base when they when somebody escaped when they blew they had what was called a blow drill and hunt usually 20 to 50 people would be activated to go to the bus stations, go to the text, call the taxi cab, go to the local hotels or motels and go to all these places, call the family, stake out, you know, basically do anything and everything to recover this person as soon as possible. Yeah, and including so, getting the phone records because Marty had a Nextel phone radio as well, just like we all did. It was not his personally, it belonged to the organization, which is how they were able to access all the phone records. And see who he had, if he had called anybody or if he was still using it, who he was talking to, so they could maybe figure out where he was headed to. Yep, exactly. So, and, and that was in two, I want to say that was in 2004 when Marty escaped. I think it was 2003. 2003. Okay. Yeah. I remember yeah. it was in the early 2000s somewhere. I don't remember exactly when. Yeah, but, maybe um, even 2002, was... but 2002, 2003, because already by that point was the beginnings of the whole. And that was yes. kind of what, what tripped Marty. I into... remember because we were doing meetings 
And whenever we do these meetings with David Miscavige, Shelley Miscavige and David Miscavige and Marty and you and anybody that was in Religious Technology Center would be sort of on Dave's side of the room or behind Dave while he's yelling and screaming at us. Yep. And I remember right the meeting right before that meeting that Marty didn't ever end up getting to. We had a meeting and Dave, when he walked in, he said, no, you guys go on that side. And he made all of the RTC people, I think you, Marty, anybody else who was usually standing behind him while he yelled at us, you guys had to come and stand with us and get yelled at. Yep. And that was the first meeting when, when Marty was on our side getting yelled at, he was like, nope. I yep. ain't playing no more. And then the next meeting, he was gone. <laughs> yep, that's right. Yeah, it was that was a crazy. You're right. That was the beginnings of the you guys don't leave this building until you get these this action item list done. And we were just there, just sitting in a room for three days and we could just couldn't go anywhere. And, and yep. everybody was like, Hey, I'm gonna go. Nope, you can't go. Dave said you can't go until all the and it was never gonna get done. So it would be like you know, four days and then Dave would show up and he goes, obviously guys aren't going to get this done, but you need to do this and you need to do this. So you need to go and do your work. And then you'd get, you'd get out and then you'd go back and do your work. Yeah. And, and then and the next meeting you could get locked up in there again. So yeah, the whole was basically, it had evolved over the years to no, you don't get to leave. Yeah. We don't care. It started out as an SP room in those buildings and then it just became the entire building. That's right. So, it was the SP room. That's yeah. right. And that's where Mark Yeager, John Horwich Mike Rinder, was in there. John Horwich, yeah. all those guys were locked in this one room. And yeah. they were, and they had on the bulletin board suppressive person declares issued on them. Yeah. In the Sea Org. They were Sea Org members who had had been declared suppressive persons. But they were still in the Sea Org and they were still the COCMO International and they were still running all of Scientology. Yeah. But David Miscavige had been had declared them suppressive persons. Yeah. So answer me this. If they're declared a suppressive, <laughs> then technically by Hubbard policy, the only person they can talk to is the International <laughs> Justice Chief, Mike Ellis, who was down in L.A. How does that yeah. work? I know. It's He's in Los Angeles. So... He has no idea what's going on at this place. <laughs> no, he would be yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, sir, to any one of those people. I know it was yeah. completely weird. And I will say that during these during this time period is when I saw Shelly, her demeanor and her um, outlook just tremendously deteriorated this is where she would start to be pleading with the staff like please get your get your act together uh there were several instances where she told me personally you have no idea what i'm going through and i was really really concerned and there were several times when i was in meetings with her in her office where dave would come storming in yelling at her and i was like Ugh, and i would have to scamper out of there um and also so I, I just could see that um, she was really, really trying hard to fix things and nothing was getting better. It was only getting worse. And then in 2004 was when um, Tom Cruise came to the property and was getting his uh, six month check, his counseling step that he had to get done directly. Because he's on operating Phaeton level seven every right. six months. You're auditing yourself at your home or your work or wherever. And every six months, you have to go and get a check to make sure you're doing things right, make sure you're not doing the wrong thing. Or you, you, it's basically a way for them to make money off Scientologists when they're, they have to go to the Florida location every six months, no matter what. But Tom Cruise didn't have to go to the Florida location. He would come to the international headquarters to get his six month check. That's right. And during that time also, Tommy Davis became Tom Cruise's assistant, which was super bizarre. Like just because Tom Tommy Davis was a, a member of the C organization and now he's with Tom Cruise all the time. Uh, during the time that Tom came to the, the property, he was given offices right next door to David Miscavige. Um, in Tommy, Ar Davis or Tom Cruise? Tommy Davis and Tom Cruise, both. They were both had offices in RTC. Yes. Wow. 
So by this time, the RTC building had been built, which is the $40 million, you know, I don't know, 35,000 square foot building on that property. And, but only David Miscavige and Shelley and, and his personal staff were allowed to, to go into that building. So David Miscavige had a whole wing of that building, which was on the second floor. Um, <clears throat> and so not, no one else from RTC was allowed into that building. We s kept in our existing offices. And, um, but Tom Cruise and Tommy Davis were given offices in that building for the time that he was there. And, and again, Shelly was just so involved in, in every piece of, um, catering to Tom Cruise, even that like he, Tom Cruise brought up that he was having trouble with his two kids. Um, and so Shelly, then that's when Shelly brought Jessica Fesh back to Celebrity Center to directly start dealing with Tom's kids. And so Jessica Fesbach was a Sea Org member that was interrogating Tom, Isabella and Connor, Tom Cruise's kids at the time. Yep. Um, and so a Sea Org member was being directed by Religious Technology Center to interrogate Tom Cruise's children and find out what they were doing that was out ethics or non-survival because Tom was having problems with them. Yep, exactly. It just goes to illustrate the level that Religious Technology Center was involved in his Tom Cruise's day-to-day -day life, really. Um, and 2004, I want to be clear on this, in 2004 is when that whole uh, Tom Cruise's girlfriend thing happened with Shelly, because I remember because we in Golden Era Productions, um, we had a person who was doing all these uh, casting interviews with uh, female Scientology actresses in Los Angeles, and he was doing it as a project for Religious Technology Center to interview all these Scientology actors. And the questions were weird because they weren't about a movie. They were about Tom Cruise. What do you think about Tom Cruise? Um, what have you done in Scientology? What do you think of David Miscavige? And they were sort of being pre-screened. And um, I remember because the guy in um, Golden Era Productions that was doing these, he worked under me because I was over the, the film production area and casting was in that. And he said, yeah, we're doing some project for uh, some new Tom Cruise movie. And, da, 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 da. and that was what he had been told. And so then when I went home and I was like, oh, yeah, we're doing all these weird interviews for some Tom Cruise movie. And you're like, that was no Tom. That's no Tom Cruise. movie." Yeah, I don't think I told you until after we left. I, Maybe I don't know, that's I, when I said it. Do you remember when we were doing those things and you were like, yeah, that wasn't for that. That was so he yeah. could get a girlfriend. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, because remember at that point, I didn't know I was about to get put in the hole and, and I couldn't, yeah. I wasn't allowed to share any information with you. That's right. Because the, either you would get interrogated or I would get interrogated. <laughs> and so it was like this, you know. You can't rely on somebody not to rat you out. If yeah. they're going to get interrogated for 22 hours, they're most likely going to rat you out to end the interrogation. Yeah. So you can never tell somebody something that they could possibly rat you out for because you know they will. Yeah. But I wanted to say that was also during the time when I was at a meeting with Dave and Shelley in a production area. It was in the compilations area that were doing the books for all of Scientology. And we were having a meeting in there. And during the meeting, Shelly had handed me her clipboard and her stuff. Like she had like a little bag and a clipboard and a whole bunch of little things that she would carry with her. And for some reason she had to go show somebody something or do something. And she gave it to me. And then almost immediately um, they got a call, some legal thing or something. And all the Dave and Shelly and Larice, those guys, they all ran out to go to the meeting. Yeah. And so then they left and then I'm holding Shelly's clipboard and stuff. And I'm sort of like, oh, great. I need to, this is going to be weird because I got to somehow get this back to her and I can't just give it to anybody. I got to really give it to her. So what I immediately went into the bathroom and read every single thing that was in the clipboard. <laughs> of course you did. And, um, Only and you would first, do that. <laughs> the, first, the first thing that the first document that I saw was a list of all of the Religious Technology Center staff members were which job, who all the name of people, why they were leaving Religious Technology Center and where they were going. And you were at the very top of the list. And it said, Claire Headley, 
she's going to go to CMO Int. And the reason it, and it just said, Mark, that's it. <laughs> and I was like, oh my goodness. And so during that time, and I eventually get, get, went up to Religious Technology Center and I gave her the clipboard back. But then, um, but then every, every once in a while, it, when I did see you, because we very rarely saw each other, because I would come home at maybe not, or you would come home at four and I'd already be asleep, or I wouldn't even have been home or whatever. We would see each other maybe once or twice a week, maybe. Yeah. And whenever I'd see you, I would always be like, are you going to divorce me or what? I know. And, like, no, and I was no, like, why no. do you keep asking me that? Cause you never told me that you'd seen that list. Of course, yeah. again, just to illustrate how little we were able to share. It's not like we were comparing notes or, you know, even, even saying one negative thing about David Miscavige from either of us would have been pretty much the equivalent of a death sentence in that yeah. place. So, oh. so yeah, I, but I was, I was so like, cause you're, from one side, you're asking me, are you going to divorce me? And from the other side, David Miscavige and Shelly were both on numerous occasions telling me, you better divorce Mark. And so I- If you I, want to stay in Religious Technology Center, right. you have to divorce. And to be fair, I want to say there was three or four other couples in Religious Technology Center and all of them divorced their husbands. So like Jesse Radstrom and Litzia, Litzia divorced Jesse. Um, Warren, uh, Warren McShane and Marcy McShane were divorced. And, and ironically, not to get off topic, but when we yeah. discussed this in our deposition, um, cause, cause I started listing them all the people off of who was forced to divorce and somebody who left after this told me that following that deposition, they, they all got back together again. That's you're, right. You're I remember Warren that. McShane. <laughs> That's right. They made all the couples get back together yeah. because we had told them that they forced them to get divorced. So then they forced them to get back together. It yeah. was the craziest yeah. thing. Yeah. It was also with uh, Carol Burke and Thomas Burke. Um, John Thomas, Darnell, Fleur Thomas. Yeah, Darnell Bloomberg and David Bloomberg. Like there was a whole oh, massive right. long list. Was it Lyman? Well, Barbara Griffin refused to she divorce did. Greg Griffin. Yeah. She was the treasury sec. She knew where all the religious technology center money was. And she was like, I'm not doing it. And you're not going to make me. Yeah. And, and she just, they just never got divorced. Yeah. <laughs> she was this sweet, short, little round lady. And she was not one bit afraid of David Miscavige. Let me tell you. <laughs> she was like, no, 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 no. Of course, she would never stand up to him. But in yeah, her yeah. head and by her actions, that was very, very clear. So <laughs> yeah. that was wild. Yeah. That is craziness. Yeah. But, um, but yes, okay. and Shelly, Shelly did tell me personally, she, she said, yeah, now I'm having to do a project to find Tom Cruise a wife. Um, and this was because she was increasingly seeing that David Miscavige was spending more and more time talking on the phone with Tom Cruise and not doing anything to do with leading Scientology. And that was why she took that project on, according to what she told me. Yeah, wasn't there? I mean, I want to say that they were going, I remember hearing and seeing pictures of them snowmobiling and, you know, doing trips and going off on scuba diving adventures. And he was doing a lot. He was at this uh, fo uh, football games with... Uh, David Beckham and Tom Cruise, and he was basically just traveling around being Tom Cruise's best friend. Yeah. And and then when he'd show back up at the base, he'd rain down terror on everybody, and then he'd go back off and go scuba diving or something. We right. Just feel like and he, he, David Miscavige would often say that we were taking him away from and distracting him from where he could make the biggest impact for Scientology. That part was very, very clear that, ta that he, David Miscavige was of the view that if he's, you know, out hanging out with Tom Cruise and opening up ideal orgs and uh, doing that should be his main activity, not getting involved in management. And yet he is the one who'd been doing that for years. So it, it was, you know, as with many things in Scientology, constant contradictions, but yeah. Awesome. Okay. Is there any other um, key things that you wanted to say about Shelly before we uh, wrap this one up? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I always end, for the people that I've interviewed, I always end with, 
if you could talk to Shelly now, what would you say? And my message to Shelly would be, look at your life. Are you happy? Are you doing what you want to do? Are you free to do what you want to do? There's a whole ton of people that really care about you and want you to have the freedom to live your life as you see fit, not based on anything you've been led to believe since you were six years old. Um, and I, I just hope that she would, I hope someday she wakes up and does get out and does reunite with her family and does have the freedom to do what she wants and come and go as she pleases as a human being. Yeah. And let's not forget, a lot of people ask, like, why do we care about Shelly? What, what's the deal with Shelly Miscavige? Shelly Miscavige has been with and seen what David has, David Miscavige has done physically and mentally torturing people for decades. Yeah. She was witness to it. She was there right by his side until, you know, the early 2000s. And if, there was a witness or there was a person that could speak on behalf of what David Miscavige has been doing, she would be a key person. So the fact that she's, you know, we did a video not a, a few weeks ago where we talked about this new Church of Spiritual Technology location that she had uh, been registered to vote at. And it would be, it, if, you, if we were still there, it would be very weird for her to be at that location. Yep. That would just be an un- it would just be an unthinkable thing where she would be. There would be no good reason for her to be at that place. So the fact that she was at that place is is a very you know interesting fact of her journey and where she's being moved. And to be fair, she could have been moved to any one of the other locations by this point. Yeah. And um, and so. That's why we're trying to find out about it. A lot of people want to know uh, where this this gal is that got disappeared by Scientology. And, and it really um, does it really does epitomize what's wrong with Scientology. It's not that Shelley is the only person. There are many other people who have vanished into this organization, and we don't know that they're okay. And so to continue exposing this practice and to continue exposing what Scientology does and how they operate, that's why this is important. Exactly. Awesome. Okay, guys. Well, thanks for watching. Thanks for getting all the way to the end of this one. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Until Bye. next time. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help support the channel, feel free to check out the merch store link in the description. We have Hail Xenu, Xenu is my homeboy, and BFG branded mouse pads, shirts, mugs, all sorts of other stuff in there that helps us to bring you new content on a regular basis. You can also pick up a copy of my book, Blown for Good, Behind the Iron Curtain of Scientology, in hardback, Kindle, and Audible versions as well. There's also a link to our podcast, and you can get that on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you'd like to watch another video, you can click on this link right here, or you can click on this one here, or you can click on the subscribe button right here. Thanks a lot. Until next time.